Um, so I'm Joanna. I'm a senior originator at Low Carbon Trading at BP. I'm originally German, in case you're wondering around my, um, my weird accent, but I've now been based in London for quite a long time. Um, and I've been working at BP for more than 17 years, various parts of the value chain. I started working in, um, in chemicals, I've been at the refineries, have traded from fuel oil to distillate various things, and actually was the head of BP Marine for a while, looking after the bunkering operations here in, in Cape Town as well, which was always worth an excuse to come for. Um, so against that background, I'm super excited to be here today. So let me just start by thanking Africa Energy Week for inviting me and for all of you really to take the time to listen to what I have to say today, because it's a topic I feel really passionate about. Um, which is, um, the, yeah, they're working. Carbon markets in Africa, um, opportunities to scale investment and raise the ambition. Let me see if this works. So I have to put this disclaimer up there, telling you that this is just for information purposes and not advice. All right. So I thought I'd start with where low carbon trading sits within the organization of BP. In particular, because I find so many people nowadays throw around the word um, low carbon and people don't really quite know, um, know what it means. So low carbon trading for us is not the part of the business that does the technology development or really the, the sort of strategy changes. So that sits within hydrogen, offshore wind, anything around renewables, even biofuels. That does not sit within my part of the business. We absolutely do have this in BP, but that's not, that's not myself. So what low carbon trading really is, is we are very much embedded in the trading business of BP, and we are the team that optimizes the commercial opportunities around carbon allowances and carbon credits. And I will go into what carbon allowances and carbon credits actually are. Um, but the point I want to stress is that this is very much embedded in the existing fossil fuels business, in the existing value chains, where there are really opportunities to still decarbonize and actually have a commercial opportunity around that. Um, if you look at the oil and gas sector from IEA data in 2018, there was an emission of 5.2 billion tons, which is um, very, very significant. If you compare that to the EU um, emission in the same year, it was 4.4 billion ton. So there's really scope to still improve within the sector. Um, I put up here the mitigation hierarchy to, oh, I can just see the slides have kind of gone wonky, but anyways. So basically, in summary, what I'll talk about today is less the avoid, which is sort of the product design, that's where hydrogen and so on sits. I will not focus on that today. I will focus on the minimize, which is reducing the emission in your existing value chains. And I will do that against the background of a compliance market. And then I will also talk about offsets which is basically at the end of the mitigation hierarchy, if you've done everything else and you can't avoid that emission any further, you can then use offsets to reach your goals even faster. And I do want to stress that direction of the mitigation hierarchy is really important to myself as well as it is to BP. So it's not that you should use offsets and never think about the avoid. You should use the avoid, the minimize, and then on top of everything else, try to use the offsets and don't rely on the offsets to make an excuse not to do the avoid right in the beginning. Oh. So if I start with the compliance market. So in the compliance market, we have something called carbon allowances. Um, carbon allowances is where you have a central authority and that central authority either um, like auctions out or allocates a certain amount of allowances to the business that have emissions in that sector. Um, we call that a cap and trade um, principle. So to give you an example, if you are an upstream produ producer in the North Sea in the UK, the government will give you a certain allocation, which is of course done with a very complex um, calculation behind it, will give you a certain allocation of emissions that you can do for free every year. Let's say the government has given you 100 tons of free allocation per year. You find yourself you're at the end of the year and you have only emitted 80 tons. You can then sell that incremental or the sort of shortage of 20 tons to the market. And similarly, someone who has been allocated 100 tons and ends up uh, 
uh, emitting 120 tons can then buy that 20 tons of shortage from the market. Um, these markets exist kind of around the globe. They exist in Europe, in the UK, in Korea, in the US. Um, but one thing that's important to note is that carbon allowances are very regionally focused. So if you have an UKA allowance, which was the example I just used, you cannot use that against your obligation in the EU. If you have a Korean one, you cannot use that against your obligation in the UK. So it is very, it's a very regional um, program, and it also doesn't have projects underlying it. Um, maybe to give guys a bit of a sort of a feeling for the, the size of the market, the EU is by far the biggest one where this is, where this is done. And EUAs, which is the trading mechanism of it, reached over 100 euros a ton earlier this year. Of course, that's on the back of the power supply into Europe at the end of winter and with the situation over there. What I wanted to focus on a bit today, though, are upstream emission reductions given the audience. Um, and that's really in the context of scaling investment into Africa. So upstream emission reductions are carbon credits that can get generated in accordance with the European Fuels um, Directive. So carbon credits are somewhat different from carbon allowances, which I just talked about. Carbon credits are certified removals of CO2 or avoidance of CO2 that you generate in a project and then you can allocate them somewhere else. So very, very different from carbon allowances that are very regional, you cannot apply them somewhere else. Carbon credits, the beauty of it, you could generate them, for example, you can generate a uh, UER, as we call it, in, for example, Nigeria, and apply it against your fuels mandate in somewhere like Germany. I thought maybe I'll take you through an example of a project um, that we've actually recently visited, so I picked that one um, to make it a little bit, to illustrate a little bit better. Um, which is recovery and utilization of associated gas from an oil field that would otherwise, otherwise be flaring. So this is a project in China where we were the lead partner. Now, if you think about carbon credits, the first step you always have to do is set the baseline. So you have to estimate on this, or not estimate, calculate, on this particular oil field, if you did no other investment, how much emission would you have? And you would set that baseline to come up with that calculation. You then have to do a project design, you have to invest in the project, which we did in this case. Um, the project collects, it treats, and then re-injects the gas into the pipeline for domestic use. Um, so you do the baseline, afterwards you see, after having done the investment, what is the actual emission that was generated, and you see if it has reduced, and then the delta between the two, so in this particular project case it was 300,000 tons per year, you can then have carbon credits for that, and you apply that against your mandate somewhere else or in the same country. In this case, it was, um, it was in Germany. I do want to stress it's a highly technical process. You have to go through feasibility studies. You have to go through project design. You have to go through third-party audits. And in the end, the German auditor has to sign off. Um, but these projects are really powerful because they really reduce the upstream GHG emission by avoiding the flaring of gas. And there is really a commercial incentive behind doing this by having this compliance system into Germany. I also wanted to share with you um, one example from the voluntary market. So the upstream emission reduction is something we call the compliance market because there's a regulatory sort of framework around this. And for example, in this case, BP has a compliance obligation to meet into the downstream assets in Germany. There's also something we call the voluntary market, and that's really where companies have chosen to go over and above. So if you think back to that mitigation hierarchy, this is now the very last step in the offset space um, where you can invest in projects to offset the emission that you weren't able to avoid any further. Um, and the example I chose to, to um, present today is one in the clean cooking sector, both because it's energy related, so it's, it's clean cooking as well as it's in Angola, so it's kind of right next door. Um, and so clean cooking, open fires and outdated stoves still release very highly toxin pollutants into the environment, which endangers the health. Um, to give you an idea of the, the um, scope of the problem, um, the CCA, which is the, the Clean Cooking Alliance, estimates 
that annually about one gigaton of carbon dioxide is emitted from not clean cooking, basically, from firewood and non-efficient um, stoves. That is about 2% of global greenhouse gas emission globally. And it feels like such an easy thing to fix. Now, the other thing I'm kind of pointing out on the right-hand side there is that the nice thing with these projects also is there is a real carbon safe in them, but there are also many co-benefits. So um, the other thing is with clean cooking, so open fat, no, so extremely, it's extremely dangerous if you get this wrong. So they still estimate that 4 million, 4 million people die every year from the smoke that gets um, caused by these, um, by these fires. And to be honest, also, it's a very high impact, especially on women and children who have to go out and collect these firewoods. Um, they estimate about 20 hours per week they spend on collecting that. So what we have done, we partnered up with a company called Sequest Capital in Angola. Um, we provide them an offtake for the 10 years going forward. And what they are doing is they are distributing 500,000 cookstoves in the region. Um, I've been to quite a few cookstove projects. I've actually never been to this one. Um, but it's really, really cool to be on the ground and kind of see like on top of the carbon save that they have, the additional benefits that they, that they bring to the table. Now, I must say, um, integrity in this field is extremely, extremely important. Because I said a few minutes ago, you have to go back to that principle of setting a baseline and then afterwards seeing how much you have saved against that baseline. Now, if you think about setting a baseline in something like oil and gas flaring, that could potentially be it's quite simple, right? You kind of measure and say, OK, this is how, what the baseline would have been otherwise. But these projects are community projects. Now, if you even look at someone like myself, I have at home like a cooker, I have a barbecue. If you had someone to ask, okay, how often a year do I use my charcoal barbecue? It would be very, very hard to estimate. I mean, I live in London, so it's probably just twice a year because our summers are bad, but you really have to estimate how often do people, like how do they change their cooking behavior with these cook stoves? Um, so it is very easy to get it wrong. We have to get the integrity right in this place. So what we've done as BP, we have employed, we have about like a technical team of 12 people or so that look at these projects all day long. They are from very different technical backgrounds, from the registries, they are from, we have someone who's a double PhD in forestry. They're really there to make sure we get the carbon accounting right. That's because we want that for ourselves, but also because we truly believe it is absolutely needed to scale up the market. Because if we don't get that, wrong, that right, then people won't believe in the market and you'll never see really significant investment into it. So the last slide I wanted to show you was our global portfolio. Um, this is about 100 projects or so BP currently has um, invested in um, around the world, both into the compliance market as, as well as into the voluntary market. Um, and I'm absolutely not showing this to you to brag or to market this to you. Um, what I wanted to, wanted to do with this is make a point that if you look at this slide, one thing is very apparent. All of those projects are in the Global South. And if you would have looked at this slide about five to 10 years ago, they would have been mainly in LATAM. And in the last sort of five years, there's been a lot of projects picked up in, in Africa. Um, I was at the Africa Climate Summit a few weeks ago, and I spoke to a lot of governments and NGOs and investors about this. And I find it fascinating to see there are so many cool projects already that, you, there, that are on this continent. And I feel really passionate that we have to have the sort of governmental support to really scale this up now, to make sure we move more and more from sort of the, the voluntary space into the compliance space to really unlock larger scale financing into this space. It is a very, very complex market. It absolutely requires a lot of stakeholders across the globe to work together in this. That's from governments to NGOs to um, private investors, and also to communities who, at the end of the day, really hold the carbon rights um, in the country. So I wanted to end with kind of thanking you guys again for listening to me on this, because it is a topic that we all have to absolutely work on together. Thank you very much.
Joanna, thank you very much. Uh, you. That really was a detailed uh, presentation. S stick around, stick around. Let's take a few hands. Um, there are a number of hands that are already up. Can we get a microphone uh, to the left side of the room? Can we do that? While we wait for the microphone, maybe I'll ask my first question. Um, Usually when social change like that happens, where mm. you really want to get the accounting right, it's difficult to get into communities and change their behavior. That has been tradition for a lot of, uh, a lot of many, many years, right? For instance, cooking outside is not just a thing in many African uh, countries. It's not just a thing we do because we don't have the option of doing it inside. Yeah. That is a family time. That's an opportunity for us and other stars to gather around uh, the cooking area to sing songs to hang to hang out, you mm -hmm. know, um, and so moving uh, moving to a cooking stove, for instance, away from that or away from uh, from dirtier mm. means of doing so requires not just a behavioral change but a cultural shift. Have you guys thought that through? Yes. So um, maybe I didn't make this clear enough. The cook stoves are actually not, it's not that you move it from outside to inside. It's really you're changing the mechanism. You can have the cook stove outside. That's, that's so you can have it in front of your house. You can take it. It, it really depends. Um, we do think through how we drive sort of the social change, and that's where we have to work with local partners because us sitting in London, we can't properly even imagine what this, what this is like, right? So we have very strong local partners. We tend to work with NGOs and the companies as well as project developers. And then we have something, so for example, on, on Cookstove, we have something called Clean Cooking Champions in every sort of community. Yeah. They come from the community. We try to do stuff like we, for example, we distribute new cookbooks, or we really try to have like within the community one champion that then passes it on to the other ones around. Yeah. Um, but as I said, I'm also under, so for example, like in Nairobi, where I went to see quite a few projects, there are also a lot of families that have more than one cooking method, right? Yeah. Um, and I personally don't believe that they have to have just one cooking method and can never use their more traditional maybe cooking method again. Yeah. Um, just, just how accurate and rigorous is the accounting? That's the challenge of it, right? Um, I think it is getting more and more accurate. So if you look at new cook stove methodologies, they're doing some with ethanol, they're doing some with electric cooking and so on now, where it's tracked. So they can see exactly in live data that they, every time it, the, the stove is switched on, so if you have electricity, for example, every time the stove is tracked, uh, switched on, it that comes back with data on saying, this is how much you have used it. Now, of course, in somewhere like rural Angola, that might not be feasible, right? Like you might not have electricity, and that's yeah. not good for everyone. Um, so what is done in the methodologies is they basically take a haircut of it. So they say, rather than saying, okay, it's 100%, they really try to take a very conservative approach to make sure that they're not overstating it. But it's something also that gets always, um, gets always improved, and we need to keep working on it, right? Yeah, absolutely. There were three hands that went up all at the same time. Guys, can I just ask that we keep the chattering quite low? There was just a bit of chattering from the side of the room while uh, we were on stage speaking. Let's get a microphone to that lady over there. Yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you. Hi. <laughs> My name is Anne-Laure and I work for Energy Capital and Power, uh, the company which is behind this big event. Okay. Uh, I have a question for, I have two questions for you actually. Uh, the first one is, uh, since this is the African Energy Week, are you planning, is PP planning to increase the number of projects, uh, carbon credit projects in Africa? That's number one. And number two, uh, how do you actually involve uh, local communities in the process? Uh, how do you maximize local content when yeah. doing this project? Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank you for your questions. So we have, um, over the last um, year or two, significantly um, increased the project level we have in Africa. At the moment, to be quite honest with you, the market is very, very difficult. And that's also why I was kind of stating there needs to be, in my opinion, a little bit more regulation around it and hopefully sort of more African voices to be heard in that space to say, okay, we actually want to have these projects. We don't want to have maybe ESG. We like the idea of scaling this up as a global market. Um, and how do we involve the community? So it's really through local partners. So um, if, for example, like you see the biggest, uh, the biggest project at the moment that we have is in Zambia. We work at least with four or five um, global, sorry, global, local NGOs that are, that are in the country as well as, as well as with a local implementation partner, and they are deeply embedded in the communities. 
Um, we have um, a Zambian technical colleague who goes we, like maybe twi two, three times a year, but that is never enough, right? So we work with local partners to make sure it's, uh, we, we kind of are embedded enough with the community. Yeah. Can we have this hand? There was a hand right in front. My good sir, you can take it away. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Saki, but I'm from Namibia, and I'm not quite sure whether uh, this is the right platform. Mm. To, but I'm, yeah, I'm from Kaoko Green Energy Solutions, and I'm quite happy to hear uh, what is what BP is, is trying to do around carbon markets and carbon credits. Of course, um, this, these are new uh, developments, especially around Namibia, or let me say, Africa in general. Mm. Uh, so there's, there's quite you know, a lot to understand, quite a lot to, to tap into and see how do, we, how do we get that around. So I said, I'm not quite sure whether this is the right platform, but we are developing um, a project where we trying to do bio LNG um, using algae um, okay. from, from the, you know, from the sea, using the sea water. And also we have just launched our um, hydrogen cooker, hydrogen stove, okay. um, with a Netherlands company called Impact um, Hydrogen to, to use uh, hydrogen for cooking in Southern Africa. So these, these are initiatives and concepts and, and, and projects we are trying to now, how do we tap into um, carbon market and carbon credit? So uh, our idea really is around using those projects to tap into that as, as part of our, our business yeah. um, uh, profit driven, uh, you know, around it. So is BP willing to listen to something like this and, uh, and see if perhaps we can, we can, you know, be part of, of the process and get these things off the ground? So, yeah, generally that's what I wanted to hear and just see. Because I see uh, down south there, uh, there is no presence of BP around those projects. So I, I wish and I hope uh, we'll be the first one around with BP in Namibia and down South Africa. Cool. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Before you answer that, Joanna, because of time, I just wanted to take the last hand that went up, uh, and then we, you can wrap it up as a collective. In fact, there were two hands, so it's that one and that one, then we can just wrap okay. it up. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Carlos from Angola, and I'm glad to see that you have this project mm -hmm. in my country. Uh, I would like to, to ask you how um, the replacement of the, the gas, I think they use gas in doing f for the stoves, yes? Uh, I would like to know how they do it, how they do it, the, the replacement of the gas, so they can, so the community can use the stoves. And I uh, really would like to know how did BP resolve the, the issue of the heating, because uh, I think during the night, I think the heating that you have said is to use the, during the night. So I would like, I'm, I'm really curious to know how did you address this, this issue? Thank the you. second one was on heating, you said? Yeah, heating, so the heating. Okay. Oh. Um, so um, these particular cook stoves are not operated with gas, um, but there are projects where they are operated with gas. And what they have basically is you have like a, a cylinder underneath, and then we work with it's almost like small, like, like independent sort of little corner shops that we incentivize to, to then you can go there with your little gas canister, you hook it up and you can fill it up, which is actually an interesting mechanism because it also means you can fill up with a little bit smaller amount of gas. So again, we try to work with the communities and, and really get into sort of the local um, distributors. Um, on the heating, very interesting question. To be quite honest with you, I hadn't thought about that. Um, so it's something we can look at. Um, we do have wider sort of um, energy projects. So we, for example, have one with LED, um, with this like solar to LED, um, but I've never really come across one in heating. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting question. Cool, thanks, and our, and our final question. Can we, we are very over time, so, so I'm gonna give you exactly 30 seconds. Okay, my name is Paul. I work with Africa Oil Gas Reports. You did say that um, you're working with Sequest to, to deploy around 500,000 cook stoves. Yeah. How many of that has actually been deployed, if you actually have? And over a 10-year period, how many of that have been deployed? In the you said in the next 10 years, right? 
And also, I didn't get to see um, an image of the cook stove. I did see what you are transiting from, but I didn't get to see the actual sample of the cook stove. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can definitely send you more information on that. So the deployment is very, it's like in the next years. The, f the tenure is really when it's the offtake. So it's when they are starting to use the, uh, the devices and it will then be issued over the years to come. So the deployment is almost done. Yeah. Cool. Joanna, thank you so much for your time. Thank really, you. really do appreciate it. Can we give a big round of applause, everybody? Thank you.